What we're going to talk about today is something called the evolution of civilizations, or how an empire stays an empire. This will be a combination of historiography and economics. Historiography was a way of looking at worldwide human historical events, including economics, in the hopes of seeing patterns that repeat themselves. Historiography since the time of Carol Quigley has been reduced to a micro-historiography. All the departments at all universities throughout the world have turned to specializations. And Pettifor is an economist who picks up where Carol Quigley left off. So at one point we will be leaving the historiography section and going more into the economy. Today's class is an oversimplification of the issues because we have so much to talk about and so little time. What we're doing was taught over a few semesters at the Foreign Services faculty at Georgetown. Dr. Quigley once told his class that there was little point in discussing the Third World when they knew so little about how their own society works. He had an interesting theory that nations go through approximately seven stages of historical change. When we say seven stages, we're not saying that every nation goes through these steps one by one. This is a social science, so anything can happen that would change the course of these events. So, let's take a look at the chart below this. We can see that the last six civilizations have all been invaded by Europeans. Now, obviously, China is today back on the rise, but is this only because Europe is in a period of decline? After all, the rise in European power came about only because of the decline of Islam. Nations rise and fall depending on how inventive they are, how well they can create new sources of capital, goods for money. Europeans had, between the 17 and 1900s, for 200 years, they expanded through inventiveness, meaning the Industrial Revolution, and also colonization. This chart shows only the inventions that would create industry, jobs. European countries also went through their periods of gestation, expansion, and conflict, ultimately arriving at two world wars. In order for a society to remain powerful and strong, it must be organized in such a way that it has an incentive to invent new ways of doing things. There is no such thing as an inventive race, and poverty doesn't seem to be a good enough incentive to invent. If it was biological, then why did non-inventive Eastern Europeans suddenly become inventive when they came to America? Something that ties in very closely with invention is culture, which is based on tradition, which in turn is based on religious beliefs. The fact is, the structure of every state in any civilization has always been based on man's idea of a deity. Natives of Africa, the Americas, and Australia never had a unifying religion. They also didn't have the opportunity to mix with other cultures widely different from their own. Therefore, they never developed past the mixture and gestation periods of our seven stages chart. This is an article regarding the culture of Italy. Is Germany or England developing, promoting their culture, their patrimony, their arts and sciences today? This states basically, no culture, no development. By culture must be intended a concept involving education, instruction, scientific research, knowledge. For the study of art means the acquisition of creative practices. Cognitive studies show that kids engaged in creative and artistic activities are also the most gifted in science. The leaders of the European countries today want merely to create a sustainable economic system. They are not interested in culture. Decreasing expansion, growing class conflicts, declining democracy, dying science, decreasing inventiveness and growing irrationality are all signs of a society that is in decay. Here's an example. Forbes' list of America's 20 most promising companies has as number one a new fast food restaurant chain. We already have about 200. Over half the companies listed were either internet or computer related businesses. The rest included such creativity as food delivery. No industry was listed. Without industry you don't have jobs, you don't have an economics. Berlin today has around 400 houses of prostitution, all legalized and taxed. Can a city grow and develop with nightclubs and beaches? Their industry is in the southern part of the country. The truth is, Europe and the United States have had a different type of industry for about 200 years. And this is based on credit and finance. Colonization was a mad dash after the religious wars in Europe. 
from the Treaty of Westphalia, for example, in 1648. The European countries weren't divided by nation at first, but between Anglican, Calvinist, Lutheran, and Catholic denominations, and with this came the idea that human rights are decided by constitutions. We can no longer rely on the Bible to tell us what human rights are, because we all interpret it differently, and Catholics need not apply. So, there is a race between these religious divisions to stockpile gold, materials, and supplies to protect and defend themselves from their neighboring countries. Part of their motivation was to never have a Catholic power again, like Spain or the Pope. But the gold standard also had the surprising effect of creating a stronger sense of nationhood, further strengthening these boundaries. The Milner Group in England was basically responsible for most of the initial phases of colonization, starting with Cecil Rhodes and Alfred Milner. Some of the members were military, some of them were involved in sciences. Adam Smith, Edward Gibbon, Rudyard Kipling are just a few of the many members. This is not a secret society, but a group of rich and well-educated men who would meet for dinner on Friday night. They talk, come up with ideas, form partnerships and it's usually the idiot grandson of one of these guys who gets the bright idea of privately publishing a book listing all the important names. As skilled as they were in political and personal relations, endowed with fortune, education, and family connections, they were all fantastically ignorant of economics. And this includes Adam Smith, even those members of the group who were regarded as experts on the subject. Globalization begins with this select group of individuals. They controlled almost every aspect of it, and each period of globalization has ended disastrously. The first period came at a time when Britain's finance sector was bankrolling railway, commodity, and mining projects around the world. Europe was able to produce its own iron, steel, and copper, but the non-European world could only obtain the necessary materials from Europe, and thus becoming a debtor to Europe. Some members of the group believed that the key to all economics and prosperity was considered to rest in banking and finance. The first part of this group controlled English politics until 1931, then the second part of the group controlled it until at least 1945. International bankers prefer to loan the governments and kings because it is more profitable than loaning to private individuals. The loans are larger and are secured by the nation's taxes. These international bankers included the famous Mayor Amskel Rothschild, whose sons generally married first cousins or nieces, and they established banking branches in Vienna, London, Naples, Paris, and Frankfurt, guaranteeing cooperation in ways no other banking system would ever achieve. The first Great Depression took place in 1873. Because all countries were tied to the gold standard, the amount of gold held in the banks had become insufficient to keep up with the demand for money that had resulted from the growth in the economy. The problem with the gold standard is that your country and economy can never grow past the amount of gold held in that country's banks. How can you increase the number of airports, the number of production facilities, if you can't increase the amount of currency available? In 1886, the world's largest known gold reserves were discovered. Cecil Rhodes and Alfred Milner used all of the instruments of imperial power, including war, to transfer the gold from Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, to London. In 1899, the Boers' War began, which had actually been instigated by the Germans. Beginning in 1914, World War I once again forced the politicians to get control of the economic system of interest and finance through controls over the movement of capital and goods. Legislation blocked international transactions and the export of gold was either banned or restricted. In 1918, World War I ended and the bankers immediately set about getting control of the financial system. Winston Churchill and others were subject to unrelenting pressure from Montague Norman, Benjamin Strong, who was the governor of the Federal Bank of New York, as well as other Federal Reserve officials. These are some of the central bankers of that time. The Treaty of Versailles concluded, among other things, that Germany was at fault for the war. Papal diplomat Eugenio Pacelli called this an international absurdity. In 1921, Germany accepted the reparations bill of 132 billion German marks. That was reduced to 50 billion marks, which they were expected to pay at a rate of 2.5 billion a year in interest, and only a half a billion a year to reduce the total debt. 
Britain further charged 26% tax on imports from Germany, and they refused to accept goods as payment. Nothing was settled by all this, but the international bankers sat in heaven, under a reign of fees and commissions. And everything continued on this course until the U.S. stopped lending. By 1925, all the most important economies of the world were once again tied to the gold standard. In 1929, the U.S. stock market crashed because of economic bubbles created by people and companies loaning money to buy stocks, forcing the cost of those stocks much higher than their actual value. In 1945, to prevent World War III, the Brenton Woods system was established. With this system also came such international organizations as FAO, UNESCO, the UN, the IMF, and the World Bank. The most important aspect of this system for our concerns was that, broadly speaking, between 1945 and 1975, governments did their best to restrict imports to what they could pay for. The IMF was created to supervise these arrangements, to act as emergency lending to countries with temporary difficulties, and also to negotiate any necessary changes to fixed exchange rates. However, what the IMF really wanted was complete power to run as much of the world as possible. John Maynard Keynes wanted the IMF to have a matching power to draw funds from countries with surpluses. The U.S. was the only country with a surplus at that time, and so they vetoed this proposal. By 1971, the U.S. had become heavily indebted because of the Vietnam and Korean Wars, and this is when Nixon defaulted on the loans, abandoned the gold standard, and developed treasury bonds. In 1970, 90% of international transactions were accounted for by trade. This is industry, goods, bought and sold, and only 10% by capital flows. This is interest paid on loans. Today, 90% of international transactions are accounted for by financial flows, and not in goods and services. When the politicians and governments changed their policies and removed regulations over finance, and this began with Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, they abandoned their responsibility for managing finance, for preventing crisis, for managing their country's exchange rate, and they also abandoned their responsibility for protecting the weak, the elderly, and the unemployed in their own country. If providing water, electricity, or heat becomes solely a profit-based company, then the poor and elderly won't get the financial assistance they did receive when those entities were state-run. This allows non-governmental organizations, such as radical fundamentalist groups with their own agenda, to move in and provide those needs which are no longer being provided by the state. Today, because of the restrictions that were lifted, credit is created from nothing. It is created on demand when a corporation or country applies for a loan from a commercial bank. The commercial bank does not have billions of dollars locked up in its vaults. When a loan is approved, this money is then printed from nothing, and then interest rates are charged on top of that principal. The bank is an empty building. It pays an interest rate to the printing bank, that's the central bank, then passes that charge along with their own interest rates, processing fees, and other charges, to the borrower. And there is no legal limit on how much interest they can charge. The rate of interest is set by the central bank, and it is nothing more than a social construct, varied only by rational choice. In 1978, for example, the Bank of England's minimum lending rate was 6.6%. In 1979, capital controls were lifted and the bank rate was 15.6%. Loans today are made to any country with money created on call from nothing at what appear to be reasonable interest rates, currently 14%. But by the time these financial institutions, the IMF, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization add on the extra fees and charges, the interest rate really amounts to 120% as in the case of Greece. They were granted a loan of $110 billion. Over time, that loan accrued $131 billion in interest and refinancing charges. 70% of that interest was forgiven, so now Greece is expected only to pay 48% interest on that one loan. 
These bankers did the same thing to Germany in the 1920s, and to Malawi, and to every other country that falls into debt and borrows from the World Bank or the IMF. And then, there's another group. Profit-motivated corporations or industrialists. Paul Romer is hailed by many as a Nobel Prize-worthy economist. He claims he wants to help poor developing communities by developing charter cities, creating a so-called democratic city alongside a city whose government has become institutionalized and therefore cannot develop. Dr. Romer's latest endeavor is to create a Hong Kong in Honduras. Its governance will be neither authoritarian nor fully democratic. Rich countries can oversee the administration of the charter cities, in particular the judicial system and police, to protect them from interference by the host nation. Somehow this will avoid the abuse of power that is so common in poor countries. This is a quote from Paul Romer. The idea of setting up a charter city echoes the way that big companies adapt to change. They often set up new divisions unencumbered by the old rules. These can be dramatic successes. Target, America's second largest discount retailer, began life as an internal startup, but eventually took over its parent company, Dayton Hudson. In other words, if all goes well, this charter city, financed by outside investors with its own government and laws, could one day take over Honduras. Dr. Romer proudly spoke of Shenzhen as a model, the first special economic zone city, created on the model of Hong Kong with market rules. The Taiwan company Foxconn moved in, and they received the contract to make the iPhone using Chinese labor. Nine laborers killed themselves in one year. Now, let me show you what they could be doing. This is an article about Brunello Cuccinelli. He invented colored cashmere and over time took over a small town that had become abandoned. His factory is based on the humanistic concept of entrepreneurship. 500 employees have the keys, work from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. and are paid 20% more than others in their field. And he built for them a theater, a center for the arts, a race course, and a nymphaeum. Brunello Cuccinelli is interested in celebrating the non-material values of man. He is interested in culture and the development of the human person. Today, we have many competing forces vying to make as much profit as possible. Industrial corporations financed by the World Bank. Then there's the IMF. They are all interrelated and all support each other. But at the same time, they are also in competition with each other and each of these groups have a certain number of economists to help them gauge economic trends. Paul Romer, for example, is a member of the American Economic Association Committee on Economic Education. These associations guide and fund universities, think tanks, academic systems, and research departments which influence what we are taught about economics. Colleges and universities teach economic theory not the actual economic practice. Universities promote the ancient wisdom of Adam Smith and John Keynes, who are no longer relevant for our understanding of the economic system we have today. We are not informed as to who is really in charge and what their economic theories mean in today's world. We are not being informed of the true economic record and who is really responsible. We are instead being manipulated by them and actually compound our own problems. Here are just two examples. There was a book recently published by a research center of a pontifical university in Rome. They included in this book a chapter written by Michael Candesis, who was the former managing director of the IMF. He's the former governor of the Bank of France. He is a central banker. And his chapter is entitled, From a Culture of Greed, to a culture of common good. As you can see, he blames culture for the economic crisis. He also states we had a well-established model of market economy. And Pettifor states that the current academic world needs to be released from the claws of the finance sector. 
She believes it is no accident that we focus on the micro and not the macro. Now, what is especially deceptive is that Michael Kemdesis is also on the Pontifical Council for Justice and Peace. And he is a member of the Commission for Africa. What else would he be doing on these commissions except to steer and manipulate them for his own interests? Because of the influence of people like Kemdesis, Catholic authors unwittingly repeat what they hear. At a G8 conference a few years ago, Christians gave speeches full of silly statements proving just how ignorant they were about the economic system. Instead of recognizing the guilty party, we blame ourselves. We blame the victim. How much do you think Kem Dessis and all of his financial friends consume in a year? Every other aspect of our lives is subject to regulation, whether it is how we act at our job or driving rules, or how we treat others around us or the moral and religious rules such as the Ten Commandments. Certainly then, economics also needs a strong structure and permanent regulations and controls to stop these financial crises from happening. Be informed and don't be a victim.